What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to another episode of Real Talk with Zuby. Before we get into it, a quick word from our sponsor, Ground News. Today's sponsor is Ground News. Now, if there's one thing that we can all agree on, it's that the media landscape is fundamentally broken. Both social media and the press are incentivized to exaggerate our differences and amplify division. A lot of people ask me where they should go for news that they can trust, and I don't usually have a good answer for that. However, Ground News has taken a totally different approach in improving the broken media ecosystem. They're a news comparison platform, giving you the ability to compare how sources with different political biases are covering a certain story, so you can easily see if it's being spun to fit a political narrative. You can click on any article and see how balanced the coverage is. The blind spot feature allows you to see stories that are exclusively being covered by either the left or the right. This allows you to identify news that you may otherwise miss in your own bubble. Ground News is an apolitical platform. It's a place for moderates, conservatives, liberals, and the politically homeless. Try it for yourself today by downloading the free Ground News app on the App Store or Google Play Store. Just go on the store and search for Ground News. Highly recommend it. And we are back. So today's guest is running for London mayor. He is a member of the London Assembly and also the leader of the Heritage Party. And this is, of course, David Curtin. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Really good to be here with you. Awesome, David. I've done a brief intro there, but for people who are not familiar with you, tell them a little bit about who you are. Yeah, sure. Well, I've been on the London Assembly for five years. And so my job over that time has been to question Sadiq Khan, uh, who's been the mayor of London. Um, and there's a lot to question, actually. So you may have seen some of my my videos uh, asking him about all of his um, policies and, and bad decisions. But um, I've now started a new political party, which is the Heritage Party. So I'm the leader uh, of that. This time last year, I was just writing the manifesto. But I mean, I basically set it up to be a socially conservative party because there really isn't one in the United Kingdom. And you've got the so-called Conservative Party that isn't really doing what it says on the tin and so on. So I started um, the Heritage Party to stand for um, defending our heritage, being proud of our country, representing traditional family values, financial responsibility, freedom of speech and liberty, uh, and which has become a big issue this year. So um, th those are the main things that we stand, uh, stand for. And um, yeah, I'm now campaigning to be London mayor which is uh, happening on Thursday so we're nearly done with the campaign and looking forward to the election itself awesome well we're gonna get we're gonna get into more of the political aspects in a moment but I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your background because I think that's always interesting to find out how people got to where they are now by looking at where they've been so give us a little bit more info about your background yeah, sure. I mean, I grew up in West Sussex. Um, my mother was English. My father was Jamaican, but I never actually met him because uh, he left before I was born. But there you mm -hmm. go. I grew up. My mum was fantastic. She did all she could. And then I went to... Uh, University in St Andrews. I studied chemistry, and uh, then I actually went to another couple of universities after that to do teacher training, and also then to do a master's in chemistry. But ended up teaching chemistry, so I did that for twenty years or so. I was a chemistry teacher up to A level and IB diploma level, and I taught in the UK, but also in schools abroad as well. So I spent some time teaching in the USA, uh, Botswana, Bosnia, uh, and Bermuda uh, in on in my time as a teacher. And then I got involved uh, actively in politics back in 2012. Um, uh, and that was because I was concerned if, about political correctness. And, and also I wanted to uh, leave the European Union. I didn't think that that was the, the right thing and the right future for, for the UK. So I sort of joined in the, the Brexit um, battle, if you like, uh, politically. And, um, and then that's sort of what led up to me uh, standing for the London Assembly in 2016. I got that. I'm curious, when you say that you became concerned about political correctness, what was it that yeah. struck you to the point that you wanted to, you know, put your put your head above the parapet mm -hmm. and get involved in politics? It was just seeing more and more crazy things sort of coming in. And, and, and then if you just had the wrong opinion, which is not considered to be the politically correct opinion or liberal, I don't know, the, the word liberal sort of means so many different things to different people, or maybe you could say progressive. I mean, I, I, say, I use the, the phrase cultural Marxist, which sort of explains the ideology behind political correctness and how um, freedom just to say what you want to say, just simple common sense things, having traditional values, you are 
increasingly smeared uh, either as a bigot or a homophobe or a xenophobe or something just for having um, a reasonable opinion. You know, for mm -hmm. example, um, you know, I think immigration levels are too high. Um, and, I, you know, for, for years and years and years, people have been smeared uh, as a racist and a xenophobe just for saying, well, we should have a sensible immigration policy, for example. You know, that's just one example of many, many different things. I mean, but mm -hmm. it goes across the board. Uh, and, and so, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, just stand up and say, look, um, we should have the freedom to, to say what we like. You know, I have my opinion, you have your opinion, but, you know, you shouldn't be smeared and cancelled uh, for having a reasonable opinion. Mm -hmm. And how did you become a social conservative? Is that how you were mm -hmm. raised? Or is that how you've always been? Or are you someone whose views have really changed and evolved over time? I think I always have been. I mean, personally, I'm a Christian. Um, so a lot of my beliefs and, you know, my foundation comes from my faith. Um, but, but you know, politically, I've, I've sort of had socially conservative values. I mean, I believe in, you know, economically, I believe in free markets, but they should be fair, you know. So I, I believe in sort of individual responsibility and enterprise uh, is a good thing. I don't believe in a big state. So that's sort of the economic side. But I suppose I've, I've, I've had sort of traditional family values, if you like. I mean, that's a, that's a phrase to sort of encompasses you know a lot of things that are good and wholesome and mm -hmm. but i think are increasingly being denigrated by what you might call the mainstream so you know you've you, at the moment you've got the whole sort of transgender um agenda going on whereas you, you know if you don't agree with that you're smeared as a transphobe for example and that's only something that's really come in in the last five or six years because you know until about 2015 no one had even heard of the word you know transgender wouldn't have even crossed my mind to even say it but mm -hmm. um uh, increasingly, if you just say now, for example, uh, there are two sexes, male and female, someone says, oh, that's transphobic, that's offensive to somebody, mm -hmm. um, for example. So, so I mean, I suppose my, my social conservatism on that, I mean, partly comes from being a Christian, partly comes from being a scientist as well. My background in science, I just look at reality. And I, you know, I increasingly, um, you, you know, you, you just state something which you see as scientific fact, or you, you make a hypothesis science science is all about coming up with ideas making hypotheses coming up with new theories and then testing those theories to see if they're true uh if they're reproducible and then you know in making it in sort of seeing if it's um is actually a, a a real fact or something but but now you know you're sort of getting to the point where coming up with a theory or an idea is is denigrated and you are you are beaten down rather than someone saying oh that's an interesting idea let's discuss it um you're now saying no you're not allowed to say that shut up we're going to no platform you and maybe yep. even kick you out of your job as well so i think those are the sort of two streams i guess that run into my social conservatism that's interesting yeah it's interesting the so-called liberals of the world uh, certainly in the uk the usa and other anglosphere countries have become increasingly illiberal in many ways, certainly highly intolerant of anyone who dares to go against any aspect of the orthodoxy. Um, mm -hmm. It's become, yeah, it's a, it's a very strange phenomenon. And I think you're correct in saying that in the past, mm, I want to say the last normal year was maybe 2013 or so, I feel <laughs> I feel like there, there, there was a shift yeah. that happens. There was a shift that happened less than a decade ago yeah. where suddenly saying very basic, actually, in fact, mainstream opinions um, sort of became taboo and mm. people really amped up with the deplatforming and censoring and name calling, right? Everything is racist everything is sexist everything mm. is homophobic transphobic like a, a, new, a new term um anything that any conservative view essentially anything mm. or even a classically liberal view that upsets certain people is now somehow taboo and supposed to be off limits mm. i was just before we jumped on this call i was just going through the post i made earlier this morning where I said I would be interviewing you, and I can see some comments there saying, "Why are you giving a platform to a homophobe? Why are you giving a pla <laughs> Why are you giving a platform to an anti-vaxer? Why mm. are you?" Um, and I'm I'm reading them, thinking, 
this is interesting. One person, when they are calling you a homophobe, they had a tweet from you, which they'd screenshotted as evidence, um, saying that you believe marriage is between a man and a woman, and that there are only two genders. And I'm like, interesting. So that's what is classified mm. as homophobia. Um, so how do you think we got here? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned 2013, because that was the year that um, the same-sex marriage went through Parliament in the UK. And it went through without a manifesto commitment. Actually, if you, you maybe remember back, at the, the election before that was 2010, and it was David Cameron um, came in in the sort of conservative liberal Democrat coalition. They, they said, he actually said, you know, uh, marriage is a man and a woman back in 2010. And then so did Obama. Uh, mm -hmm. in 2008, before he was elected in, in the US president. But sometime around 2012, 2013, they flipped and suddenly it was like all over the English speaking world, at least, uh, the leaders in all the different countries were like, no, now we are going to redefine marriage. And and then, you know, then it was, um, it became law. I disagreed with that. And I disagree, with, I disagree with it still. I don't think mm -hmm. that that was an act of parliament that should have been passed. But now um, I am called a homophobe simply for saying, I I don't agree with that particular act of parliament. Marriage is a man and a woman, which it, it still is legally uh, mm -hmm. in the majority of countries around the world. I mean, you, you know, well, there's nearly 200 countries in the world. I don't know exactly. Um, but, you know, 160 to 170 of them. Marriage is a man and a woman. It's sort of just the Western European, North American countries seem to have changed the definition of marriage. But now you're considered a homophobe if you don't have the right politically correct view, um, which is progressive, if you like, and, and you sort of got the cultural Marxist um, ideology coming in, where, you know, homosexuals are considered to be victims of a society which is um, institutionally homophobic. And this is the sort of language that people use and the sort of narrative that, that people push to try to describe society and, and make out that society is unjust and therefore we need to have some kind of change in order to make it just. And then that undermines the traditional family. And then, of course, um, not just me as a Christian, but other people of faith are then um, you know, pegged and, and smeared as homophobes for that. And, you know, it's very interesting on the campaign here because I was uh, in Croydon last Wednesday and I was interviewed by ITV okay. and uh, the reporter came and uh, we spoke for 10 minutes about all the issues to do with London, transport, bicycle lanes, uh, police, crime, knife crime, housing, the green belt pollution. But at one moment, she asked me, what does the Heritage Party stand for? I said all the things. And I said traditional family values. She said, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I knew she wanted that little clip. So I said, OK, I'm a Christian. I think marriage is a man and a woman. And I don't think that it's right to teach young children compulsory LGBT inclusive relationships and sex education. She immediately says, aren't you homophobic? And uh, the, the, the little 20 second clip that they showed, that was all they showed. That was what they wanted. But all the other things where we just talked about things, you know, we could agree on, but they wanted that little clip where they could say, oh, he's a homophobe or oh, terrible person. He doesn't agree with the um, uh, politically correct narratives. And so, you know, here we are a few years after um, the, the sort of introduction of uh, same sex marriage. And then you got that and then it went on to the next step which was transgenderism and and who knows what the, the next step's going to be after this mm -hmm. what's your main opposition to it from a political perspective um to to same-sex marriage my, my yeah. politically i don't think that a child should be deliberately denied a mother and a father. You know, the, a, a child really needs a mother and a father ultimately. Now, of course, there are some families that, that do well um, with single parent families. I'm from a single parent family myself, you know, mm -hmm. but in the sort of bell curve of success, children do better if they're brought up with their own mother and father. So I don't agree with redefining marriage and then so you can get different kind of family types are then legalized and you could are deliberately um, undermining the traditional family, which is a mother and a father getting married together, having children. And, and you're saying, now you're saying, you know, Sadiq Khan would say this, who I um, question uh, regularly, that uh, they're all different types of family and they're all equal and we all need to 
celebrate all different family types. I don't agree with that. I think the traditional model of the family, mother, father, bringing up their children, is the best model because on every measurement and, and of success, children do better uh, in, in terms of education, in terms of um, uh, employment uh, and financial success, and uh, there, there's less depression, less crime, less involvement in gangs and so on for children who are brought up in a stable uh, family with a mother and a father. Not always, but, but that's a, the, in general, that's, that's mm. the case. So I think we need to uphold that. I understand that. Mm. How, with that said, playing devil's advocate here, how would you sort of, given where we are now, how would you be able to sort of split the difference between a mother and a father versus two parents in general? Because I think we, there's a lot of data out there. If you want to look at data and stats, there's a lot of data out there regarding um, you know single parent family versus two parent family, which of course traditionally mm. and even now is you know 90 something percent plus of the time is going to be a man and a woman. Um, and I think, you know, those outcomes, the data is very clear if you're looking at a general population level. But I think there would be people who say, well, what's important is there being two parents rather than it specifically being a mother and a father. So what would you say to that? I, there, there was a, a really good um, synopsis of uh, like a, a research of research done by by a, a Jewish um uh, academic called Shum, I can't remember his first name, it was, it was only a couple of years ago, looked at all the sort of data on families and, and found actually that if you have uh, a mother and a father who are married, the outcomes are better. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, so, I mean, I'm just going by research um, as well, looking at, um, you know, an overview of, you know, hundreds of different academic papers that have been written on this um, by, by that sort of study of studies. Okay, I, I don't I don't know if that really answered the question because I mean, did those studies look at say uh, male male couples and female female mm -hmm. couples? Because I doubt that there's I mean even just given time, there isn't enough time yet to have mm -hmm. that data. So, as someone who's you know more traditional leaning myself, I can totally understand that. I'm just trying to intellectually be honest and consistent about what we sort of data wise anyway what we know and what we don't know. I mean, I think if it's from a, a moral or an ethical perspective mm. or even like a slippery slippery slope perspective, those are all different ideas and arguments. Um, my personal position is I don't even, I'm not even convinced the government should be involved in marriage. I don't even know if that's, I know that's how it is, mm. but as someone who's libertarian leaning, my mm. view is sort of like, well, is that even is that even really the government's business? I know the government has made it its business, mm -hmm. but is that really the role of government to start coming in here and telling people who can and can't get married and who can do this and who can do that? That in itself seems like it may already for a long time have been a bit of a government overreach. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, again, sort of social conservatism looks at history and looks at, you know, how uh, foundations have been laid by generations and past and what's handed down the wisdom of our forefathers and ancients come to us and, uh, you know, trying to preserve that and preserve culture uh, and then pass it on to future generations. So from that basis, I think, you know, it's always been a man and a woman, you know, mm -hmm. in, in this country and in most countries around the world um, through most of time. And it's been a, the successful model, and it, and it's the natural model. Of course, you need a male and a female to get together to have children. So you know, just basically on on the very basics of biology, you know, uh, that that's the sort of couple uh, you would have, uh, you know, as as the foundation of a family that reproduces and has children. So you know, trying to interfere with that, you know, which is the natural. Um, you know, order of reproduction, I don't think is, is is very helpful at all. And trying to say, well, a certain group of progressive academics can, you know, know better than all the other people in all the other generations in all of time and in all of the places. I don't, mm. I don't think that that, uh, you know, I, I, they, they get far more credibility um, amongst the sort of metropolitan elite in, in, in the big Western cities that, than they deserve. I understand that. And what are your other socially conservative perspectives mm. that you think are not being well represented at the moment? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's interesting. That there's a couple of things that people always point to, and you know, they they would m agree with free speech and liberty, would agree mm. with financial responsibility. Uh, low immigration might be one of the things that we mentioned as well. I don't think that um, uh, we should have open door immigration. I think we should be training uh, enough young. British people to do the jobs that need to be done in this country. You know, for years and years, we haven't trained enough doctors, enough nurses, enough engineers, enough plumbers. And then we've been uh, you know, bringing people in uh, through mass immigration to do those jobs where we should have trained our own young people to do. So I think that's another supposedly socially conservative point of view that maybe other parties wouldn't represent. The other one is that uh, uh, we're a pro-life party. So, you know, there's a section in our manifesto which is entitled The Culture of Life and you know, in that, um, you know, we say that the tragic or terrible fact that uh, in the UK there's 220,000 abortions every year and that number is growing. Um, and and uh, we want to do everything we can to reduce the number of abortions. You, you know, we haven't set out a specific policies yet for uh, a Westminster general election. But when that time comes, I will be, um, you know, saying we, we should reduce the, the age limit and we should cut some of the categories um, of, of which for which abortion is allowed um, you know may, maybe uh, quite quite drastically would be mm. my, my position in terms of immigration what is the correct number um, I would say less than 10,000 net you oh know, wow okay that's, net, what, is, what is it at the moment it's about 300,000 net, but no okay. one really knows. It's probably more than that because there, there's many people coming across the channel uh, every day in dinghies. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many there are. We don't know how many are coming in on the back of lorries and so on. You know, you saw that um, case where tragically, you know, 29 was or 39 Vietnamese were, were killed and suffocated in the back of a lorry that came in through Tilbury. That's probably happening every day multiple times they're not getting killed but they're coming through and you know being uh, deposited on farms somewhere mm. to do slave labor um so yeah i i would say n n not a gross figure but net the net figure should be very much lower than it is but then okay. that means you know you 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 would have you know 300,000 coming in 300,000 going out every year because it's you know we're not going to close the doors <laughs> completely but i think it should be balanced mm -hmm. um you know so that it does doesn't lead to um, severe population uh, increase and in growth. Why is that? Why is that such a controversial position? Um, it's seen as racist, but well, it's 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 portrayed as racist by some people, um, but it shouldn't be because it's just common sense. We're a small island, and. Um, there's not enough infrastructure being built, uh, you know, for to cope with the massive influx of people. I mean, London, for example, has got a huge housing crisis because its population has gone up by two million in the last 20 years. And that's the official uh, figure. It's probably gone up by more than that. But there's mm -hmm. not enough houses being built or schools or, uh, you know, the police stations have been closed rather than opened, for example, to deal with increase in crime. Um, so for me, it's not a controversial position at all. But, you know, you, you do have, you know, the Labour Party, particularly some of the people there would say, oh, it's racist. You want to keep out foreigners. Well, well, no, I, I just want a sensible, balanced immigration policy. And I want our own young people to be trained, you know, properly and given, you know, every um, chance to succeed and have the opportunity to succeed uh, mm -hmm. in this country rather than, you know, bringing trained people in from abroad. So, um, but I think there are some parties, you know, Labour, for example, over the last um, 20 or 30 years has got votes from it because people come in from from certain places and they tend to vote labor so they love it because mm -hmm. it, it boosts and um uh you know it keeps them in power in yes. certain places certainly does no question yeah similar thing happens in the usa as well with mm -hmm. the democratic party so that's an interesting that's definitely an interesting point there mm -hmm. why do you think it is that i mean do you think it's just that or one thing I find really intriguing as someone who has grown up in different countries, traveled a lot, seen different cultures, as you have as well, is that there are certain things in countries like the UK and perhaps the USA, let's say Anglosphere countries, where certain ideas or certain policies that are very, very common 
around the world um, and are not criticized around the world are somehow stuck with all of these labels when it comes to a country like the UK, right? So if you talk about low immigration, if a country in Africa or South America or Central America or uh, China, Japan, Asia, the Middle East, etc., even Australia, like a lot of, there are many, many countries with much, much tougher immigration policies than the UK and the USA. And people are generally cool with that, right? Like it's mm. fine. Like no one is complaining that Japan has a tough immigration policy. No one is complaining that, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia has a tough immigration policy yeah. or uh, China has a tough one or, or there's lots of countries. I mean, mm. at, why is it that in the West, and I, I know certainly in Anglosphere countries, it's it's always linked to some sort of ism or phobia, right? Mm. It's always racism or xenophobia and bigotry and hatred. It's, mm. it, it can't be it, it, as, if, as if there's no other potential reason, whether or not someone agrees with that view, mm. and this goes for a lot of things, it's like people don't even want to entertain the notion that there could be another reason why someone holds those views except the worst thing possible, right? Brexit. Yeah. People are just like, oh, people just voted Brexit because they're racist. I remember mm -hmm. the following day, people said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm living in a nation of racists. I saw this even on my own Facebook feed, which is generally filled with fairly intelligent people. I'm seeing people there who went to Oxford University in Cambridge who are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm in a nation of racists. And I'm there mm -hmm. thinking, regardless of your view on Brexit, how can you think it's as simple as people who are racist versus people who are not. I mean, does that even, uh, logically, that, that that's clearly nonsensical mm -hmm. to me, but that's how people frame everything now. Well, there was a really good, an interesting book written a, a few years ago by David Goodhart, and I think it was called The Road to Somewhere. And, you know, the thesis of his book was that there's two general types of people in the UK and perhaps in other Anglosphere countries, and you would call them the anywheres and the somewheres. And the anywheres would be people who don't feel an affinity with their home country. You know, they've gone mm. to Oxford or Cambridge or university. They work in a global corporation. They go to holidays abroad. They travel around and they consider themselves as global people um and but then there's the the somewheres the people who are far far more rooted in you know, england or scotland or britain or canada whatever they consider you know uh, i'm patriotic about my country i love my country it's got a wonderful history a proud history you know and you know we go on holiday maybe a little bit but you know i'm english i'm british or you know whatever i'm canadian i'm mm -hmm. american and um the 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 anywheres consider that the the sort of people who are somewheres, you know, which is like me, you know, I'm, which is, oh, it's very odd because I went to university, I've travelled around the world, I, you know, I love travelling, you know, I love countries in the world, I don't yeah. hate any any countries, but I consider myself to be British and I'm proud of my country, but they would look down on me as a terrible bigot and xenophobe because I love my country, you know, mm -hmm. I think I live in a wonderful country, but the, you know, it's a really bizarre thing that the the, the sort of people who are the elite if you like the the anywheres they have a disdain for their own country a real dislike of their own country and and uh, it's it, me it's something that doesn't make any sense because mm. you know your country has given you every opportunity every chance every you know it's the people who do well and, and the most successful um have benefited from from being born and having a British passport, but yet there's almost a you know a shame and a and a, a, a loathing for their own country. This is um something which is very bizarre, but it, it but it exists in the psyche of mm. the people that in this book are called you know anywheres. And you know I I don't myself I don't understand it. Um, you know I I I really don't. But but it, this is this is a sort of um you know a phen phenomenon. Mm. It's very interesting to me. I mean, there are people who get triggered when they see a British flag or a U.S. flag in the <laughs> yeah, U.S., like right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that upsets people. I mean, someone will does, yeah, see a yeah. British flag on an <laughs> item of food and they'll write a whole Twitter post screaming about the fact that there's a British flag on their butter that they bought in Sainsbury's yes, in yes. Britain. And it, it's so odd to me because it's really, it's really unique mm. to this part of the world. Um, I think perhaps there's some historical guilt linked mm. in there where people think that they are somehow responsible for the, the potential sins of their ancestors and mm. so they need to atone for it in some sort of 
so, sort of self flagging self flagellation yeah. um you see this linked with even you know concepts of privilege you know whether it's white privilege or white mm-hmm. guilt or all these terms that are coming up now and you know mm-hmm. people come out there talking about i i'm a white person and i'm i'm an oppressor and i'm this and them and these poor bame and poc and bipox oh, we need please. to take <laughs> Oh, please. I hate that. I I know, I know. Me me too. Me too. But it it, it also just intrigues me because I'm just watching, like, what is going on here? Like, this is so, this is so bizarre to me. Like, I can't imagine uh, going back to Nigeria and seeing people complaining about the number of black Nigerian people on the TV or (laughs) screaming at someone for having a Nigerian flag or saying that it, it's really peculiar to me. Like it, I think it's sad, but I do also think it's kind of funny. You know, <laughs> it, it's sort of funny when they go really extreme with it because it becomes quite almost like a parody. But I just do wonder where that comes from. Yeah, it is. I mean, there's this whole narrative that's going on about slavery. You know, historical slavery, which happened yeah, two hundred to 350 years ago yes the the uk was involved in the transatlantic slave trade it was terrible but then we spent all of the 19th century um getting rid of it you know and um not just in the the uk you know we're the first country to big country anyway to to abolish slavery i think denmark did it before us but Mm. they they didn't really have many slaves or many colonies but you know the the uk was the first um a big country and uh, in history and so that's something to be very proud of and um not just in the uk but going around the world you know stopped the arab slave trade in east africa um which was brutal far more brutal than the the transatlantic slave trade and stopped the the barbary coast slave trade which was a trade in europeans uh, being sent off to the middle east as well no one talks about this um but then you know i've had various debates with people about this over the last year or so because of this whole sort of black lives matter phenomenon that's grown up and um you know, I, I mentioned, well, well, you know, this was in the past. Now you've got modern slavery. It was 27 million slaves plus. And that's just a, a low number. Um, you, you know, there's, there's black slaves in Libya, um, for example, in Mauritania. You've got slavery in, in, in the UK with sort of foreign people enslaving foreign people. I mean, there's, there's, there's people that come in on the, the lorries we talked about earlier, think they're coming for a really great life in the UK, mm-hmm. and they end up on a, on a farm somewhere where they're, you know, their passports are taken away and they're not getting any wages or working in a nail bar. Um, they can't speak English and they have a, you know, they're, they're basically modern slaves. And the colonialism which is going on in Africa right now by China, which is you know more intense and more extreme than I think you know anything that that happened in the the British Empire, but the the sort of the 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 woke you know anti racists as they call themselves are absolutely silent on on this. No mention of you know child slave labor in Congo mining mm. cobalt for people to have um, uh, big batteries for their electric cars. No one's interested in that. You know, it's people like me talking yeah. about that. You know, so this is slavery that's happening now. But then these people are not interested in that because they're just interested in virtue signaling to each other and they get brownie points for bashing Britain or bashing America or mm. bashing Brexit or, or whatever. And um, But they're not really interested in, in the, the plight of, of any people who are not themselves so it's a it's a it's it's a it's you know it's really a narcissistic uh nasty kind of narcissism i think that that these people have got um and they they signal to each other uh how wonderful they are by bashing uh their own country but not caring about the real issues of what's happening today yeah i also think it's a big shame because also it's also a distraction Mm. because the thing is there are genuine problems Within the country, outside of the country, in the world, there are genuine social justice issues, mm. right? There are there are genuine there is genuine oppression. There are mm. actual genocides or borderline genocides going on. There is slavery going on, and like you said, the same people who will be all on their high horse, you know, using the right hashtags and putting the right symbols in their social media bios, etc but they will be dead silent on so many things that Mm -hmm. take so many more lives and take so many more black lives. If that's what you, Mm -hmm. if that's what people are claiming they care about, Um, you know, 
sex trafficking and there are a lot of genuine fights and you know I do have genuine respect and admiration for real activists who are actually mm. taking some of these difficult battles mm. and pushing mm. for them because it's very easy to be a slacktivist it's very easy to just say hey, oh 20 it's it's 2020 oh BLM is trending mm. let me let me throw that hashtag in my bio and like you know the fist and I'll just say the right words and put my black square on Instagram and scream at anyone who doesn't and people think oh that's that's changed the world like we've ended mm -hmm. racism or we've stopped police police brutality yeah. or whatever it is and i don't know i i do like to imagine that most people mean well i mm -hmm. do that's something i generally try to imagine in my life i know some people certainly do not because mm -hmm. i've interacted with a lot of them mm -hmm. um but it, it it is frustrating because i think there are a lot of real issues where regardless of someone's political orientation they would actually agree that okay this thing is really bad like this is a, a horrible you know the what's happening with the Uyghur Muslims in China mm. right that yeah. is unequivocally awful right it doesn't matter if yeah. you're conservative mm -hmm. liberal progressive whatever can we all agree mm. that's bad this is something that should yeah. be dealt with right if you're looking um more locally or nationally uh homelessness you know uh knife mm. crime rapes grooming yeah. it's like yeah. can can we all agree that mm. this is not something anybody wants and that we need to take mm. a stand on this but instead people are there screaming about uh, pro not pronouns and um mm. you know random making up genders and doing mm. this and doing that and yeah and then of course conservatives tend to be quite reactionary so then mm. you get the reaction and next thing you know everyone's embroiled in this battle over mm. honestly nonsense honestly nonsense yeah um and no one wants to it's hard to step back and be like actually let's take a breather and look at what really yeah. matters yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, London is, you know, a cauldron of this, you know, it's a sort of microcosm of, you know, the wider world in a way, but you've got all of these issues happening in London, you've got, you've got grooming gangs, but nothing's being done. I mean, it's the only big city in the UK where there's been hardly any uh, arrest or prosecution of grooming gangs. And mm. I actually asked Sadiq Khan about this and uh, my questioning was closed down by the chair of the assembly didn't want me to, to keep on uh, questioning and when I said that you know his response to me was <clears throat> are you asking me because of my faith are you asking because of my ethnicity and I said no I'm asking you because you're the police and crime commissioner for London oh. Should know about it. You should be doing something. But then I'm, I was closed down. I wasn't asked, allowed to ask any more questions. Maybe it was getting a little bit too hot for him. But, you know, I wasn't. I mean, it's nothing to do with his no. um, religion or his ethnicity. This is, this is a crime that's happening. Go and sort it out. Go and protect the victims and go and mm -hmm. arrest the perpetrators. It's a very simple. But, you know, we've had this for, for decades in the UK, of course. Yeah. Um, where, where it's known that it was covered up because it was considered racist to even talk about it, which is ridiculous. Um, you know, this is, this is how political correctness then affects real life and allows um, victims to continue being victimized mm -hmm. because you've got these um, uh, views which are ring fenced by the sort of rot violence of political correctness and we need to to break them down we need to to get past them and, and you know kill those rot violence if you like metaphorically mm. speaking and actually you know just just cut crime for goodness sake you know you've got gang crime in london going going out of control you've got 50 percent increase in most types of violent crime in london over the last 50 years and a lot of it is gangs young young you know i say it young black men in gangs killing other young black men, not exclusively, but there's a lot of that. What? Who wouldn't want to stop that? I mean, what, why am I not allowed to say that this is the reality of what's happening? Well, I do mm -hmm. say it anyway. And then I, I get called, you know, oh, no, that's not, you're a racist for saying that. It's Just, just stop the... Excuse me, I don't want to swear. Stop no, the crime. I, I, I hear sake. you. I, I, find it, there, you know, I find it extremely frustrating as well because, you know especially when people start throwing these terms out, like, you know, racism, da, da, da. Like, is the racist the person who is trying to stop more and more young black boys from getting stabbed, mm. right? Or is the racist the person trying to shut down the conversation so that you can never even get to the potential root cause and root causes of some of these issues so you can actually diagnose the problem and fix it, right? Mm. And people would just rather, like you said, it's so narcissistic, right? They just want to throw up their hashtags and say the right things and you know they don't care if these boys are getting slaughtered on the streets like they they don't care um you know if black lives matter we'd be talking about abortion more um mm. it's the leading cause of 
death of black people, certainly in the USA. I don't know in the UK, um, but people don't want to have anything that's uncomfortable, right? Mm-hmm. It's like no, in any conversation that's real and genuine and which could actually make some progress, regardless of that people are going to have different ideas on how to solve these issues. And that's mm-hmm. fine. But can we at least talk about them? Right. I mm-hmm. think the things that you're not allowed to talk about in many cases are the things that most desperately need to mm. be spoken about. And I find it very concerning the chilling of free speech and people, you know, being called names and being thrown under the bus and the cancel culture and this and that. Cause I'm just like, it, this is, this has real repercussions because if you cannot diagnose and talk about a problem, you cannot fix it. If it's totally taboo to talk about um, broken families or single motherhood and the impact that has on young men and women and how it can be linked and correlated with certain things. If you're not allowed to talk about that, Mm -hmm. the issue never gets fixed. If you're not allowed to talk about immigration and have a genuine, honest conversation about it, then it doesn't change, right? It just, it just stays the same. And house up house prices keep shooting up, you know, and unemployment goes up. Um, people may not be people who are immigrating may not be integrating well into society. You could have trafficking issues, all of these things. Mm. And by narrowing the Overton window so much, it Mm. just prevents anything from being done. And I think that's, I don't know, in many ways, things are better than they've ever been. But in the same way, there are many things that have been backsliding, I think, especially Mm. over the last 10 or 15 years. I I think it's kind of come to this level where political correctness is certainly doing much more harm than good. I think maybe if you went back 50 years ago, political correctness was maybe sort of a good thing if it just was like, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't be calling black people the N-word or, you know, this and that, Mm. right? That's politeness, essentially. Mm. But when it gets to the stage of, oh, no, like, you can't talk about that. No, you, you, you can't do that. You can't. Then that's a big problem. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a difference between social action, which is maybe what happened in the sort of Victorian period, which people really could see a problem and tried to find solutions about to this, you know, people, workers, for example, living in terrible, you know, conditions, and then, to, well, how can we make their lives better, you know, not by smashing the whole country, but just just by giving people, you know, uh, you know, council homes or something or whatever, and, and, and you know, like you say, not, not calling uh, black people the, the N-word and so on you know um as a matter of course you know and uh it's, it's just to try to be considerate to people and and that's mm. great but now you've got the sort of whole whole kind of it, you know it's framed as social justice so the idea is the whole of society is unjust we need to tear it all down and rebuild it again you, you know in 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 uh, the it's going to be built on on the foundation of like uh fighting systemic homophobia islamophobia transphobia misogyny and racism and xenophobia i mean basically that's it you know well, rather th- those words were probably were not even in most people's lexicon you know back in the 50s and 60s it was just well you know let's let's be considered it to each other let's be mm-hmm. be be kind to each other um th- there's no kindness and consideration really in what sort of uh political correctness is is today it's just basically smashing uh smashing white supremacy smashing heteronormativity smashing capitalism so it's all about smashing stuff and th- this is the kind of language that that you you get from these sort of the, the groups whether it's you know blm or extinction rebellion or you, you know other other groups that are that are there sort of you know activist groups that that are sort of actively talking about um systemic societal injustice you know i i don't follow that narrative at all i think this is a is a great country got some problems and some issues mostly caused by you you know i would say the two-party system which is basically uh two hands of the same puppet um degenerating everything but then you've got the question as well to, to throw this into the mix is that the big big global corporations are winning all the time there might, there's a lot of money that, that people are making. So, for example, talk about abortion, which I know in the USA is the biggest uh, killer of uh, black black children in America. I call them children because unborn children are children. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you've got the the big abortion companies. I mean, was it Planned Parenthood there in, mm-hmm. the, in the USA is the biggest one? It's a different one here. I think it's um, Mary Stopes or whatever. But you know, they're they're getting huge amounts of money. 
uh, for carrying out abortions, and yep. you know a lot of a lot of them are state subsidised, and they're also getting money to to do this in Africa as well. Yep. You know, yep. to set up international branches. Mm -hmm. I think that's totally wrong. I mean, I would defund all of them completely. Agreed. I mean, th th that's just the first step. But, you know, the, the people that uh, so people are, are making a lot of money out of this kind of misery. And, and you know, the, so the, there's money in it as well, um, as well as sort of um, uh, trying to uh, undermine sort of societal cohesion. So th these two things are going together. And, uh, you know, this is why I'm, I got actively involved in politics to some mm -hmm. extent to, to fight for that, you know, to, to, and I feel like I'm fighting sort of 20 battles at the same time, you know, pushing the Overton window out, as you say, and trying to bring common sense. And, and I know there's so many people who, who think the same, um, but they, they don't know what to do. You know, mm -hmm. they don't know how to act. Uh, they see everything crumbling and falling down around them. But, you know, people are atomized and isolated, um, you know, especially with the whole sort of lockdown situation that we've got at the moment. Um, but, you know, I'm trying to, to build something where people can actually get actively involved in politics and fight back, you know, um, over the long term to try to, you know, reestablish our foundations uh, mm -hmm. in, in a manner which is, you know, wholesome uh, once again. Yeah. Do you know what I think conservatives, this is both in the UK and in the US, perhaps worldwide, really need to get better at? And this is two things, I'll say. They're sort of linked together. Number one is branding. I think that, hmm. I think perhaps because most creative people are more left leaning, I think that when it comes to branding and messaging, the left always has the upper hand mm. with that, right? And and especially when it comes to getting young people, right? There's mm -hmm. always, they, they have the upper hand when it comes to branding. And then also, which is linked to it, culture, right? Engagement mm -hmm. in, in the culture, you know? I think a lot of conservatives, not all, but I think a lot of conservatives don't fully, people talk about culture, but they don't engage with it as much as a lot of liberal and left-leaning people do. I'm talking, I'm a musician, right? I'm a rapper. Yeah, I'm yeah. talking music, <laughs> arts, mm. um, entertainment, movies, all of these things which do have a real impact mm. on, you know, it was Andrew Breitbart who said that politics is downstream of culture, mm. which has a lot of truth because if you can shift culture, then politics tends to follow. If you can normalize an idea in the culture, then ultimately you can then shift the legislation, right? But, you know, starting with the legislation can be can be quite difficult if people haven't culturally accepted something. Mm -hmm. But if you if you see what's being normalized in the culture, you can mm -hmm. normally actually predict quite well what's going to happen politically. And I think that more left leaning parties and even individuals implicitly or explicitly understand that very well, which is why I think they're always trying to you know, play with the language, control the language, right? Because mm -hmm. if you can control the language, if you can change the meaning of the word man, and you can change the yeah. meaning of the word woman, or you can change the meaning of the word marriage, or you can change the meaning of the word racist, or white supremacy, or sex, what mm -hmm. you can then play these games. And mm -hmm. it seems like in, in my observation, and I say this as someone who's, you know, openly more conservative leaning, the conservatives are always sort of playing, playing the game. Right. They, mm -hmm. Like the, the left is sort of setting the rules and setting the language yeah. and setting the boundaries. And then conservatives are trying to stop it. But once you're already playing defense, you're always sort of seeding, mm -hmm. you're seeding that ground. And I think that I don't know what the answer to it is. This might just be sort of the nature of mm -hmm. the two sides of the political party and how it's mm -hmm. always been. But I certainly think that more conservatives and libertarians or even just sens mm -hmm. sensible liberals just need to get more involved in that rather than just, for example, when I talk to lots of conservatives in the US, you know, Republicans, it's always about the voting, right? The votes, mm -hmm. the votes, you know, we'll beat them at the ballot box. We'll, we'll vote here. We'll vote. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. cool. But like, there's more than just the politics. Like even if, even when Trump was in office for four years, the culture is still mm -hmm. being, you know, it's still being run. It's still being manipulated. CRT is still being taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Kids are still being told about, you know, this and that. And the music is putting out this and the movies are putting out that. So I think there needs to just be a higher level of engagement and support in these things that are overlooked, but which really do shape society mm -hmm. 
and what people believe and the sort of stories, I guess, the yeah. stories people tell themselves, right? What, what are children watching? What are they listening to? Mm -hmm. What YouTube videos are they watching, right? Like, what are they paying attention to? Because that all helps to shift it. And then by the time that person is 20 or 25 or 30, um, you know, it has an impact. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And the thing is, we can be blind to that in politics, you know, um, because, you know, you say, as you say, where it's about the voting, it, you know, politics tends to be very rational, cerebral, you're looking mm -hmm. at things from a, you know, intellectual point of view, or oh, here's a problem, here's an issue, how do we solve it? What policies do we use? What words do we put in place to, to change the law and so on? But yeah, that's completely different to to culture, I mean, the two things should go together, but they're, they're often separate because, you know, the, the ordinary person who goes out and votes, you know, once every four years or five years, will often make an emotional decision. You know, mm -hmm. not not interested in, you know, all the the different arguments I've had on the transport committee over, you know, in June 2017. No one knows about that, even you know, <laughs> who cares even less. Um, you know, so um, a lot of the time, people will just look. Oh, there's the leader of the party. I like him. I like what he says, but mm -hmm. they don't actually sort of have, you know, um, all their work words in their head just sort of a picture that they built up around somebody and so you know if you have sort of um them boosted in the culture or you know denigrated in the general culture that's going to have an effect mm -hmm. on how people vote but but yeah absolutely the the sort of issues that, that, that we're talking about you know i mean conservatives tend to i think they don't want to change anything. I mean, I, I don't want to change anything, really. I'm happy <laughs> I'm happy with things as they are. You mm -hmm. know, I just want, you know, to be left alone, to, to mind my own business and get on with my life and, you know, ju just yeah, be happy. But you've got the sort of, you know, left, is, you know, traditional left or progressives, whatever you might call call them. Uh, you know, they want to change, undermine, smash things, build it up again <laughs> in a different way. That's what they're doing. I don't, I don't want to smash and rebuild, you know, yeah. make and break. I'm not interested in that but that's what they're doing you know and they're relentless and, and this is the thing they will push and push and push um and, and eventually they might get to a point where they pushed and you go okay we're going to push them back a little bit and then we do and we think we've won but no they just carry on pushing <laughs> you know what i mean and and yeah. then we go oh okay i'm going to push it back here ah oh, one again no you haven't because they just carry on mm -hmm. you know so what we've got to be is as relentless and as um you know energetic and, and and is committed for you know decades and maybe even centuries you know this is a battle that's going to take longer than a lifetime to to you know rebuild our country and um uh, you know make it a, a fantastic place to pass on to our children and to the next generation um but but yeah um the the cultural cultural thing is something that you know I, I don't have the the time and the bandwidth to engage too much in the culture because i'm so busy in politics and i'm you know i'm leading a party so i'm really yeah. busy with the party it's like i've got so much to do i'm busy all day every day but you know the, there's um it's so important to to do that and to to actually put the the messages out put put conservative messages out mm -hmm. you know in in media and um you know it through video through music which is what you do which is fantastic um and 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 other forms of art because you know that 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 you know speaks to people's emotions and 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 often i forget that because uh, you know yeah. I'm sort of <laughs> chemistry scientific sure. background, looking at like atoms and figures and patterns, and you know, but the emotions are, are you know most people make emotional decisions. So yeah, yeah, it's important. Very much so. I think I think something that's really important as well, especially if you're looking at young people, mm. um, teenagers or the early twenties, etc. And th this goes beyond anything political, but I think that what is considered cool is really important. Mm. You know, what is considered mm -hmm. cool, right? It, if you have a culture, I mean, okay, say, say you have two cultures or two societies or two groups of people, mm -hmm. and this culture thinks that education is cool mm -hmm. and going to university or college is cool and entrepreneurship is cool and business is cool mm -hmm. and uh, making money is cool and getting mm -hmm. married in, is cool and having family is cool, right? Mm -hmm. And then this society thinks that um, going to jail is cool. Selling drugs is cool. Um, violence is cool. Um, disrespecting your parents mm -hmm. or disrespecting women is cool. Having children out of wedlock is cool, right? All of these things, you know, yeah. on average, how those two 
groups are, are going to come out. And I don't, again, I don't know the answer. I'm sort of talking almost like a, as, as, a, as an observer here, but something I found really interesting because I've, I've done a, it's something I want to do more of in the future, but I have done things um, both in the UK and I'm going to be doing some in the US as well of, you know, talking to young people, teenagers, and just explain, you know, explaining certain things to them. I have a sort of advantage being a rapper in that I can say certain things that maybe if their teacher says it to them, they're a bit yeah. like, uh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe. But when they hear it from someone who they see, oh, okay, like, I think this guy's cool. And he's <laughs> saying this thing, then you kind of, kind of sort of see this shift in their mind and in their behavior of like, oh, actually, yeah, that's kind of cool. Like I do want to run my own business or mm. I do want to get involved in this, or I do want to do this or that. And oh, okay, actually, this is cool, you know? Um, mm. Oh, actually, yeah, in the future, I do aspire to have a family. Like, that would be cool being mm. a father, mm. right? That, that, that's cool. Um, and I think if people can work out how to do that, I don't know all the answers, mm. <laughs> then I think that would really, really shift society because you mm. can literally break it down by certain demographics. And if you look at that and you look at income rates, success rates, poverty rates, et cetera, what is worshipped and glorified and mm. praised and rewarded and considered cool varies very it, it varies a lot right a mm. lot of people yeah. will say oh you know look at asian americans or even asian british people mm. or whatever and mm. you'll say okay well what yeah you're right as a demographic successful okay why like what what's going mm. on here and you see and it's like okay well they're promoting the the right things the right things are considered cool yeah. mm. and then you might look at another demographic and you're like okay well the wrong stuff is being rewarded. The wrong stuff is considered mm. cool, right? It's cooler to go to prison than to mm. go to uni, right? If you have any society where it's cooler to go to prison than to go to university, you're in trouble. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I wasn't very cool at school because I wanted to work hard and, and do well and be academic, you know, and mm. go to university. Uh, that wasn't considered cool. So I didn't yeah. didn't fit into to sort of the groups that didn't want to do that. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, generally, I would say in the UK, for example, you've got the Indian community in the UK, and they have those fantastic, you know, mm -hmm. values of like wanting to, uh, you know, create wealth, be entrepreneurial, start a family, you know, family stability is considered you know and held in very high regard mm -hmm. and and generally do very very well you know both men and women um you know in the indian community they they they're you know highly regarded it's fantastic you know yeah. but there's there's other groups as you say and um they, they don't have those values and and uh yeah um it, it's yeah. hard but it, it it's it's going to take time but you know i think like you say um people going into schools i know from being a teacher it's it's horrible for the teacher when you have you have a special rapper come in and they get all the glory you know i'm just the person <laughs> I'm, i don't know i'm just the bog standard guy who talks about atoms you know in my my chemistry class and then you know you come in and they're like oh wow zufi's here isn't he great and then they'll come back to me and they'll all say oh I want <laughs> for the next week and they're not cared they don't care about what i say <laughs> no, that's it but but it's good it's really good and that's the you know we need we need you to go in we need and we need people with with the um, conservative values to go into schools you know this is something people can do you know as a sort of voluntary thing you know on the side somewhere because if you don't the 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 cultural marxists are going to go in and they're going to undermine kids mm -hmm. you know they're going to they're going to confuse them about you know the 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 you've got you know the transgender activists are going in and they're propagating the notion that boys aren't boys and girls aren't girls and they have to accept all of this and and, and this destructive Mm -hmm. uh, you know, force is going into schools, so they're doing it. But we need to go in in greater number, uh, with 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 uh, more relentlessly, uh, more consistently, to you know overturn the damage that has been done and to to, to build things up again. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in the younger generation, but it, not just through schools, but it's through you know it's, the world is completely different. I mean, I don't 
I'm 50 now. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of social media um, that, that, you know, is going on that, um, you know, I don't know about um, <laughs> people who are you younger. Don't have, you, don't, you don't have a TikTok <laughs> account just yet. I don't. You know, no. I got myself a, te- a Telegram channel just today. I'm probably like a, two years behind on that. You know, next year I'll get TikTok when it's only used by grandfathers. You know, so. <laughs> so, there'll be something else coming up. <laughs> so, David, you are running for London mayor. If yeah. you became London mayor, what are the three biggest changes you would make? Yeah, okay. So first of all, the police, uh, I want them to be focused on cutting real crime, cutting homicide, violent crime, cutting burglary, cutting vandalism and thuggery, you know, so I want a, a, a unit to cut burglary, I'll open a unit to investigate grooming gangs, but I won't be having the police uh, going round, you know, hitting freedom protesters over the head with batons or, um, you, you know, arresting people and fining people for meeting their friends and having a cup of coffee. You know, the police have got to be doing catching real criminals and not hassling just ordinary citizens for doing ordinary things. So that's a I want that's the change I need to make in the police. With transport, that's the other big area the mayor's in charge of. This is a big issue in London. There's so many road blockages and plant pots have been put up at the edge of people's neighborhoods and pop-up bicycle lanes which are narrowing roads so london has just got so much more congested and especially in the last year because of all the sort of silly road blocking and road narrowing measures that have been put in by this mayor and the boroughs i need to get rid of them all and just get the roads flowing again so that people can move around because you know the the two big parties are totally in in hock to this so-called green agenda um but the green agenda doesn't work it doesn't work anywhere, but it, it really doesn't work in London because people just can't get around because mm. all the roads are blocked. Um, and the other thing is, uh, I, I'm anti-lockdown. We need to end the lockdown in London. Uh, mm. So I'll have a policy of non-enforcement, of closing businesses and getting customers out, you know, people sitting outside a coffee shop or whatever, um, you know, or sitting inside a coffee shop and, and, and the business gets closed down and the customers get chased away. It's yeah. insane. Why are the police spending their time closing businesses? I mean, this isn't mad. So end the lockdown, get London moving again, make London safe again. Awesome. And David, where can people find out more about you and your campaign? Great. So the Heritage Party is my party is heritageparty.org is our website. And then my own website that says more about the London campaign is davidcurtain.net. Awesome. And where can people follow you on social media? You're active on Twitter, yeah? Yeah, I'm on Twitter at David Curtin. I'm also on Facebook, uh, so you can look me up there. And I'm on Gab too. i uh, got my account there, David at David Curtin. I've just opened a Telegram account as well, which is a t.me slash David Curtin. So, yeah, you can find me on all those places. Awesome, David. Really good to have you on the show, man. Fantastic Thank conversation. Thank you. Great to chat. <laughs>